Good morning, everyone. I want to give a quick little screencast kind of showing the advantages of overlaying a torque box onto an immutant. Um, principally that it results in an application server, a single process capable of deploying both Ruby and Clojure apps and having those apps interact with each other via either messaging or caching. Um, so let's get started. Uh, first and foremost we'll install a mutant and then overlay it with TorqueBox and then fire it up. Um, just FYI, I'm using Linegan 2, the latest release, and I'm using uh, that version of the Line of Mutant plugin. Um, we fired up a shell. I've already done kind of the part that takes the longest in the interest of time. Uh, first off, I cleared out my Immutant installation, so we're starting completely from scratch. And I ran the uh, install command of the Immutant plugin. I did not give it a version, which I could have, um, uh, but I didn't so that I picked up the latest incremental release of Immutant, which tends to work best with overlay while we're kind of uh, making sure all these things work well together. Um, similarly, I did the same for TorqueBox. You notice it says no feature set provided assume in TorqueBox. That's the only feature set we uh, support at the moment, but eventually we'd like to be able to let you do that um, to, to have uh, Scala apps cohabitating, um, and also that, which would have JavaScript. Um, both of those are, are kind of the equivalent for those languages, uh, AS7 based app server. Um, but anyway, we didn't do that. We overlaid TorqueBox. Now, the reason I didn't do this uh, live is because that first one, installing a mutant, takes about a minute on my craptastic charter high speed internet. Uh, it's about a 66 megabyte download, which is half the size of the TorqueBox download, uh, uh, which takes about two minutes on my network. Um, Toby has recently uh, slimmed down a mutant quite a bit, and I expect he'll do the same for TorqueBox eventually, so that won't take as long uh, going forward. That's for Lance. Um, okay, so we got it installed, we got it overlaid. Let's run it. Um, we could run it either with uh, the immutant commands, or we could do it with the TorqueBox uh, run command, or we could do it with the JBoss uh, uh, shell scripts themselves. Either way, as long as we have the modules installed, they'll be activated and started and and we'll get both TorqueBox and the Mutant features. Now when this guy starts up, we want to make sure we don't see any uh, exceptions among all the noise he spews out. One thing of interest, uh, when he starts up, he tells you what versions of everything he's using. And you'll see we've got uh, messages both for TorqueBox and the Mutant. If you follow the threads, you'll see exactly what versions of things you're using. Um, note specifically for uh, the incremental version of the JBoss AS we're using, the incremental version of a mutant that we're using, and the incremental version of TorqueBox that we're using. Uh, okay, we got this guy up. That's pretty much it for installation. Um, so let's deploy a couple of apps. We're going to just do a, a very simple closure app, just give us an in-REPL endpoint. We're going to do something similar using the TorqueBox console gem, uh, something Lance Ball wrote that uses, basically puts a pry console um, inside uh, TorqueBox for us. Uh, so we can do that. Let's rename this buffer, because we're just going to keep this guy up. We'll call him server, fire up another shell. Um, and we'll create a simple closure app. Let's call it simple. Um, and with what he creates, we're just going to change one file, add a very simple configuration for a mutant, um, telling him what port to fire up our NREPL endpoint. Save that, go back to our shell, line a mutant deploy it yep and we're gonna because we're not in that directory we're gonna give it the path um, to that line again project and if we look at our server output we'll see him hopefully detecting it yep he's starting the deployment of simple um, we didn't give it any initialization so he's warning us there but he is starting up the in ripple endpoint and it's deployed so at this point I can fire up my nrepl el, point it at that guy, 
and I'm connected to my app. Um, so we can do whatever we need to there. We'll come back to that in a second. Let's get the Ruby guy going. Uh, okay, so to, do, to install this gem, we want to make sure that we're installing it in the right place, the same place that our torque box is installed. So that's going to be the same place the a mutant plugin installs a mutant. So we set that guy there, make sure he's first in our path, so that when I install TorqueBox console, he gets installed to the right place. Uh, TorqueBox console is neat. We're not really using in this demonstration all of its uh, capabilities because um, what it's really useful for is um, connecting to any Ruby applications you might have deployed um, and and interacting with them at a, at a console, which is nice. We're just going to use it to gain access to the, the, the TorqueBox libraries um, for messaging and caching. So once we did that, it gives us a command in, that, uh, in our path, because we have the TorqueBox OMJ Ruby bin in our path, um, that takes a number of arguments, but the latest version uh, doesn't require any arguments. Um, he's just going to uh, lazily um, create or deploy an application. You can see the server picking it up down there. Um, uh, and then he's going to connect to it. So we're in. Um, kind of a two-step process. Yeah, there we go. Uh, so I should be able to say howdy. Uh, yeah, and I see that down there in the log output. All right, so now we're in connected to two sockets. Uh, one for closure at the bottom and one for Ruby at the top. Uh, let's check on our notes again. Yeah, we just did that. So now let's kind of play around with the messaging libraries for both of these guys. Um, uh, yeah. So we'll require the mutant messaging namespace. We will start up a queue. Let's call it foo. Um, now obviously I can publish Let's not, let's not say how. Let's just say, let's just publish it. You know, that, that enqueues the message, and it's very simple to receive it. Um, now that's just closure to closure, right? So let's do the same thing for Ruby. Um, here, normally, I would require my Torbox messaging gem. Um, it returns false because it's already there. The uh, Torbox console itself uses Torbox messaging. Um, and I can create a queue using this class. I want to give it the same name I used um, on the closure side. And when I do that, I should be able to receive it. Yeah, and you can see up there I get it with the uh, Audi Ruby. So that works easy enough. Let's try it the other direction. Um, let's publish. Uh, we're going to find out that this won't work. Um, so when I publish this, well, it works. It does enqueue the message, but it enqueues it with an encoding that um, the closure side doesn't understand. And so he'll drop an error. He's looking at a property on that JMS message. We put a property every time we publish a message with the encoding of that message. And Ruby, by default, will use Ruby marshalling for its messaging, um, which Closure doesn't understand. So let's, um, because we know we're going to have polyglot consumers, we want to publish the message with an encoding that those guys. Uh, will understand. And we support uh, Eden, which is the closure extensible data uh, notation. Um, there's a Ruby gem for it. There's a number of uh, various language libraries for it. Um, we also support JSON. Um, we can do that too. Uh, so I've got the message in there. And so this time, when I receive it, oop, it will work because I got it. Uh, I meant to change that. Um, we can do Eden too. Yeah, and it actually does work. So uh, it's kind of a pain to add that encoding each time you publish. So thanks to Merrick, um, a recent change enables me to set the encoding 
uh, when I create the abstraction for this queue, and that way I can say um, without the encoding on the on the publish, even though I could override it if I wanted to, uh, he should encode that with whatever I created that queue with. So at this point, uh, let's try this. So I'm gonna I'm gonna just assign the message uh, the, the receipt. Um, to a, a, a local variable, and we can kind of query it. Now notice, I sent a JRuby, uh, a Ruby uh, time object, a date time object, and the Eden encoding um, on both sides resulted on the closure side taking it as a Java util date. Um, uh, but same time for each. And this works both ways. Should be able to say, and publish, um, Java util date, and then when I receive it over here, yeah, I get the Ruby date time. Um, so that's nice, and we can do any kind of standard data types or uh, deeply nested um, uh, standard collections on either side. It should work just fine. Uh, publish. Actually, let's do it. I'm more familiar down here. Um, Let's see if I have any in my shell history. Yeah, let's do that one. Um, so I got a deeply nested uh, a map of maps um, with a vector in there. Uh, if I publish that guy, when I receive him over here, we'll assign him a variable. Notice how uh, the closure map turned into a Ruby map. Uh, closure keywords will turn into Ruby symbols. Um, closure vectors will turn into Ruby arrays. Uh, you get the idea. Um, strings are strings. Um, um, yeah. So, and actually now I can say, let's say A, um, B2 equals 42. And so I can say Q.publish. Now when I receive, yeah, same thing. Works both ways. See, I got the 42 in there. Um, so the main thing for messaging is just uh, uh, make sure you set your encoding on the Ruby side because the default um, is not compatible with Clojure. Now you can do the same thing when you uh, start up a queue on the Clojure side. You can give it an encoding, but uh, uh, Eden seems to be general purpose enough to, to use for any of your polyglot uh, collaborators. So that was messaging. Uh, yep, yep, yep. Uh, let's look at caching right quick. It's basically the same thing. It's just when I create Ruby caches, uh, I need to set the encoding. Um, and the default encoding for uh, closure is Eden again with the caching. Um, we can look at that. Let's, uh, let's require Cache, mutant cache namespace. Um, we'll create a cache. Uh, we'll call it foo. Um, I can say uh, we'll do, we'll make that a vector and we'll do b. Um, Give it a time. And so my contents are there. On the Ruby side, I'm going to require the right gem. Um, I'm going to say, I'm going to create. Ugh. We are back by Infinispan here on both sides. We're, you're, that's a good point. Is uh, I'm using local caches here, but all that I'm showing you will work for any kind of replicated uh, caches if you have your uh, uh, overlaid and mutants uh, uh, working together in a cluster. So you can have a data grid. All this stuff works if you've got both those Ruby and Clojure apps deployed to that cluster. I can't talk and type at the same time. Now the cache new, he's kind of funky. You don't give him just a name. He takes a a, 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 a a hash of attributes, a map of attributes. So I want to give him the same name 
that I gave the closure side, and I have to give them an, an encoding. Um, I know that closure encoded it with Eden, so I'm going to give it there. Uh, what did I do? Oh, I spelled it wrong. My bad. Um, there we go. So, Pry has given us all our member variables, but the interesting one up there is uh, that at cache. So, you're seeing it's got all the stuff in there. Um, note that the, its keys, it's showing a string. So, in order for us to reference them by actual symbols, that, that having us specify that encoding is important. Um, uh, which we can do and say um, C A and that gives us our vector um, C B gives it our date time and you know it works the same way we can say uh, C dot put X D um, and when I look at my cache now you see I've got the all the D uh, well that that data structure I did earlier should be able to say x cache, and I get that. And it's still my 42 still in there. Um, so I should also say when you're dealing with the uh, InfiniSpan caches, these are mutable data structures, right? So all the normal caveats apply when using, uh, you know, like your standard uh, Java uh, hash map or whatever. When you're using that from Closure, you know, treat it, treat the InfiniSpan cache the same way you would a, a Java util hash map, for example. That's all the InfiniSpan cache is really, is a Java, what is it, uh, a concurrent hash map. Um, so anyway, that kind of sums up what I wanted to show you, I think. Um, try that out yourself. If you have any troubles, uh, come see us on Freenode in the Immutant channel, and we'll be happy to get you going. All right.